We are mindful and grateful of our student ministry retreat taking place this weekend at Camp t M in New Braunfels, where over 400 students and volunteers are gathered for a weekend of prayer and encouragement and studying God's word and just generally having a great time. Isn't that great? Over 400 are gathered. May God's blessings be upon them. Also, we're grateful to our elders and our elders' wives who, under the apt leadership of Mark Sharp, gathered for a weekend of prayer for this wonderful congregation, praying for the future of the church, the blessing of God, the favor of God upon the church. Aren't we blessed to have elders and elders' wives who regularly meet to pray for, pray together, and pray about the work of the Oak Hills Church family. We're equally grateful to the many, many, many of you who participate uh, each week in a small group. Oak Hills Church has over 300, yes, that's correct, over 300 groups sprinkled all around San Antonio and the Hill Country. In these groups, many of them meet to study the unshakable hope material. Some of them study other material. Uh, Many of them meet in homes. Some of them meet in restaurants. Some of them meet in schools. Some of them meet on one of our church campuses. Uh, Some of them meet in workplaces. Uh, Some meet early in the morning, others late at night, some at noon. But we have over 300 groups that meet. And so we're very, very grateful because that's really where the connections are happening. That's where community happens. We often encourage you to, if you want to grow in your faith, Lock in at a weekend worship experience, serve on one of the campuses, and be a part of one of the groups. Something happens spiritually when we worship. We believe in the heavenlies, that things are changed. The atmosphere, spiritual uh, truths are changed when we worship together. When we serve, we're using our spiritual muscles and realizing that we're busy to be the blessing of being busy about the work of God's kingdom. And when we meet together in a small small group. That's where community happens. That's where those connections happen that can really serve to provide ministry, ongoing ministry in the life of someone else. So we're very grateful to our campus ministers, our community ministers, to those who host these groups, lead these groups, and participate in these groups. And if you'd like to be in a group, there is a place for you. There is space for you. Just contact your campus wherever you attend, and we'll make sure that that happens. Well, what a week we've had. It seems like we just come out of one calamity into another. Here we're faced with yet another uh, hurricane bearing down on the coast of Louisiana and, and, and perhaps Alabama and Florida. Also, we're, we're dealing with the ramifications still re- reeling from the news of the terrible, unspeakable tragedy in Las Vegas. And so if you're finding yourself unwilling to watch the news or uh, not wanting to read a paper, uh, you're not alone. You're not alone. More than any other time, we are in need of the presence of God and the promises of God. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the promises of God. And this week's promise seems particularly appropriate. God promises, when you go through rivers of difficulty you will not drown. God never promises the absence of difficulty, just that we'll survive the difficulty. Our response, our promise is, I will respond to increasing evil with increasing faith. Now help us, Lord, to understand this great and precious promise that comes to us through your word. And help us, Lord, as we live in a world of increasing evil, to respond with increasing faith. We pray for those who find themselves in the path of this hurricane. We pray for those who find themselves personally affected by the tragedy in Las Vegas. We find an opportunity also, Father, to pray for all those who face any challenge, asking for strength. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Forgive our speaker. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said,
I've been having fun with a little trivia question over the last few days, asking people, where do you turn in the Bible to find the very first appearance of the word grace? Where do you turn in the Bible to find the initial appearance of the word grace? Most people assume it would be in the epistles of the Apostle Paul, the great champion of grace. Some suggest it would be in the teachings of Jesus Christ. A few have suggested that the first appearance of the word grace is actually in the Old Testament, probably in the Psalms, one of the Psalms written by King David. And then a few people have looked at me like, why are you asking such a stupid question? (laughs) Well, Bible study, I remind them, involves good archaeology. Just as we dig deeply for evidence of a people or a humanity or a society, so good Bible study digs deeply to find the earliest evidence of an important idea. And grace is the big idea of the Bible. And so how far do we have to dig in Scripture before we find the first appearance of the word grace? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a moment. But first, let's make our declaration. You thought I had forgotten So sit up straight, put your shoulders back. If you don't know the drill, watch somebody around you. They know it. They're going to sit up straight and they're going to put the shoulders back, fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Say it like you mean it because even the devil is listening and let him be convinced what we are about to do. You ready? We are building our lives on the promises of God because his our hope We do not stand. Amen. So when did the word grace first appear in the Bible? We need to turn all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Here it is. But Noah found grace. In the eyes of the Lord. That's right, Noah, the ark building, animal herding, flood surviving, dove sending, wine drinking Noah. The word grace first appears in the Bible when his name does, and it appears after one of the most sombering of paragraphs. If you like to fill in the blanks, let's begin by looking at the corruption, the corruption. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can any verse get lower than that description? Look at those descriptors. Wickedness was very great. Every intent, only evil continually. We're tempted to write such a verse off as hyperbole, but then we remember the skeletons of Auschwitz, the skulls of the Cambodian killing fields, or the bodies of the Tutsis in Rwanda, or even the mass murders in our own country. And we reconsider. Might wickedness become so great that every intent is evil continually well it did in the days of Noah but how did such evil happen and how did it happen so fast I mean just six chapters earlier we were reading that great creation sonnet let it be and so it was and God said it is good let it be and so it was and God said let it 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 is good Let it be, so it was. Six times it appears. And it was always good. Light and land and seas and skies. Good, 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 good. And the the days culminated with God's magnum opus. So God created men in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed the first couple. He told them to have babies, to have dominion, to help each other and help themselves to the good life. 
How could they do anything else? I mean, their work was their play. Animals were their friends. Funerals were unnecessary. Lions loved lambs. Skunks didn't stink. The earth didn't quake. And thunder didn't thunder. It was a perfect paradise. And it was a perfect marriage, man and woman, sinless. They wore no shoes, for there were no thorns. They wore no clothing because there was nothing to hide, reciprocal and mutual, separate and equal. He had her, she had him, and they both had God. These were the good days. Yet into this world of all joy and no fear, a snake of evil slithered. And he asked, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? What an insidious seed to sow in Eve's heart. Not the seed of rebellion, not the seed of anger. Satan was more subtle. He sowed the seed of doubt. Has God really said the seed of distrust? And as fast as you can say chaos, paradise became exactly that. Fear drove the couple into the bushes and shame left them hiding behind leaves and lame excuses. And that was just the beginning of their woes. Their firstborn killed their secondborn. And one of their descendants demanded multiple wives. The family tree soon grew red with shed blood. And by the time we reach chapter 6, the children of Adam have descended into an evil pit from which they cannot climb. And separating them from God were seven generations of hard hearts. And so God said this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. No one longed for Eden. No one craved for God. No one grieved the fall or longed for the garden. No one, that is, except Noah. We've looked at the corruption. Now let's look at the exception. You know, Noah in this passage, Genesis 6 and verse 8, is described as the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I wish I could tell you how Noah found grace. I wish I could tell you more about Noah. How this descendant of Adam came to be good in a world gone bad. How this butterfly landed in a pigsty. What did he do? Did he pray? Did he fast? Did he pray fast? <laughs> we know what he did after He found God's grace. He became a boat-building, sermon-preaching, animal-herding hero of the faith. He saved the human race. But what about the young Noah? What about the Noah before this moment? Who knows? We don't. In fact, we call him Noah because we don't know a thing about him. I was very proud of that (laughs) sentence. You wonder what preachers do with a whole afternoon? We try to think up sentences just like that. All we know is this. Noah trusted the promises of God. In the long lineage of the people of the promise, the name Noah appears at the top. He trusted the promise of God. In fact, not only does the word grace first appear in the story of Noah, also the word covenant first appears 
in the story of Noah. God told Noah, I will establish my covenant or my promise with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So God made a promise to Noah. He promised him a safe place, a certain deliverance. God told Noah to expect 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And what began as a pitter patter resulted in a flood that swallowed up all the high mountains and the living creatures, and most significantly, the rebellious people. They had flooded the earth with rebellion. God would flood the earth with water. The flood did come, the boat did float, and the planet was purged. And after 40 days of rain and eight months of floating, Noah and his family came to rest on dry land. They were protected. God made a promise. God kept his promise. And then he showed a rainbow in the sky and with that promise said he would never flood the earth again. This is a great story. But is it more than that? Does it have any significance to our lives in this day and age? I think it does. I think the the corruption that is followed by the exception leads to a very encouraging application. You see, really, not only does the word grace first appear in the story of Noah, really the picture of grace appears in the story of Noah. God has sent us a rescue vessel as well. And when our world feels flooded by evil and trouble, God has sent an ark. Only our ark is not a boat. Our ark is a Savior by the name of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said it like this. For everyone has sinned. There's the evil. It's everywhere. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his what? Grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. You see, Jesus is our ark. We enter into him. We place our trust in him. When we sense the presence of evil around us, we step into him. His gang plank is made of the wood of Calvary. And the light that opens to the heavens from within our ark is cut through by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He himself is our ark. He himself is our deliverance. And then he comes once we place our trust in him and he seals the door shut just as God did with Noah. He seals the door shut from the outside and he guarantees our safe arrival. Storms come, troubles come, but so does God. The word for this in the Bible is grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor, his choice to be kind to people who do not deserve kindness, to give forgiveness to those of us who do not deserve forgiveness. Our choice is to simply believe, to do as Noah did, climb into the boat, to believe the promise and trust that he will take us home. 
some years ago, I came across a story that I believe illustrates this great promise of grace. It was told to me by a friend who had heard the story from a friend who I believe had heard the story from another friend. So I cannot vouch for the absolute veracity of the story, but if it carries even a splinter of truth, it's worth the retelling. Seems a certain gentleman was shopping at a commissary. All he needed was coffee and bread. And so he got his coffee and his bread, and he went to the checkout line. Behind him in the checkout line was a lady, presumably a housewife, and she had a basket overflowing with groceries and clothing and even some television equipment. As the gentleman with just the bread and the coffee stepped up to check out, the cash register attendant pointed to a fishbowl and he said, in that fishbowl, there is a correct number. And if you reach in and you pull out the correct number, all your groceries are free. Well, the gentleman looked and the bowl was overflowing with little pieces of paper, hundreds and hundreds. He asked the cash register attendant, how many correct numbers are there? And the reply was, just one. So the fellow said, what are the odds? But he stuck his hand down in the fish bowl and he fished around for a minute and he pulled out a piece of paper and he looked and wouldn't you know, it was the winning number. What a surprise. But then he realized that all he had that day was bread and coffee. What a waste. But this fellow was quick. He remembered the lady behind him the one with the mountain of groceries in the basket, he remembered and he looked over at her and he said, hey, honey, (laughs) guess what? We won. (laughs) She stared at him, but he winked at her and held up the winning number. Well, much to her credit, she had the wherewithal to play along. And she stepped from behind the basket and walked up and stood beside the man and put her arm in his. (laughs) And for just a moment, the two, now wedded by good fortune, (laughs) stood together. Out in the parking lot, she consummated their temporary union with a quick peck on the cheek and a thank you and he went home and she went home and don't you know they had a grand story to tell their kids now don't send me any emails I know it was a bit shady what they did I get that he shouldn't have lied she shouldn't have pretended no emails please all that said Isn't that a great story? (laughs) And doesn't that story remind us just a bit of the story of grace? Even more so, the lady, though she had much to pay, could pay it. We cannot pay for our sins. And yet a stranger has appeared. And with a wink of kindness, he has invited us to stand next to him. Not just for food at a commissary, but at a feast for eternity. And not just for a moment, but forever. And receive that for which we did not work. And receive blessings that we cannot overestimate. This is the gift of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Have you found this grace? Have you found this grace? 
Maybe all your life people have told you that what God wants you to do is behave or, or be good or, or be long. And so you've tried to behave or, or be good or, or be long and you just, you just get so tired. Because you feel like you never know if you're good enough or if you're behaving enough or you're belonging to the right group. But then along comes the voice of grace. The voice of grace does not say behave or be good or be long. The voice of grace says, just be still. Just believe. It's what Noah did. Now, he did a lot after he believed. But there's no record of him pounding a nail or building a boat or hurting an animal before he believed. Because of his belief, some wonderful things happened. But it wasn't his works that saved him. It was his faith. And it's not his, your works that are going to add one iota to your salvation. It's your belief. Why don't you stand on that promise? Just stand on it. And in a world that seems to go evil, you hang on to that one promise no one can take. And that is when you believe in Christ, your soul is secured. You have been placed upon the ark of God's deliverance, and he will get you home. And if you've never said yes to that grace, now you know why it's so sweet. Now you know why it's called amazing grace. And now you know at least part of the reason God makes this great and precious promise. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. Amen? And now, Heavenly Father, grant that this grace could go so deep in our hearts that it washes away the fear, it washes away the anguish, it washes away the hurt. For, Father, I'm very confident that there are those who are hearing this prayer who have felt all three. Would you please tell them that your grace is sufficient and your grace is enough. Let grace be our great joy for because no one can take our Jesus, no one can take our grace. Through Christ we pray and all the church said. 